Right, hey, welcome back everyone. Just that quietening down of the dinner reminded me of the opening bars of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Land. Maybe we should, should play that afterwards. Um, okay, welcome back everyone. Let's move on to the second half of the, the seminar this evening. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Dennis McLaughlin, who is the group CRO at LCH Clearnet. So uh, given the systemic importance of LCH Clearnet, that's one hell of an important job. <laughs> so, and he's going to be talking about perspectives on central clearing, which was, if you remember from my opening address, something that was um, quite an important balance sheet risk implication issue for banks, certainly, in my own industry. Uh, and the impact, even if one isn't a, simply a user from a risk management perspective of derivatives, the impact on your collateral cost of funding, collateral management, so on and so forth, is, is material, I think. Uh, whether one is a small or a large bank. So it's um, certainly something that I'm looking forward to listening to. Sir, please. Thank you for the invitation to talk here. Um, just to um, start off by saying that um, these are my own personal perspectives rather than an institutional level per perspectives on clearing. But I'd like to give you a sense of where LCH stands in the world today before I launch into the presentation. So we have... Um, we have about 90% of the world's swaps market that are cleared through LCH today. That number sometimes varies down to the mid-80s, but um, most of the world swaps go through us. Um, that's both client and house accounts. So we see the entire market pretty much. We also have over three quarters of the Eurozone debt financing in repos that's cleared comes through us. That's approximately $78 trillion or uh, euro, sorry, equivalent that goes through us. Um, we are a very large player in equities in Europe, and uh, we have about 90% of the world's um, foreign exchange uh, non-deliverable forwards denominated in US dollars that goes through us, that's cleared. Um, so we're very, very big in a lot of areas and growing even bigger as these mandates come into force and people are moving their exposures to the clearinghouse to try and get benefits of the netting that it, it can, and the reduction in regulatory capital that uh, as, are associated with that. Um, just one more word, we are also very, very active in the repo markets because from an institutional point of view, we receive a lot of margins from members and we have to figure out what to do with that. Now in that, in that context, we get about $150 billion US dollar equivalent in euros and various currencies sterling, but US dollar equivalent, $150 billion that we have to find a home for in various in the repo markets, if it's cash, non-cash has to go into custodians, etc. So we're a, a, quite a major player and getting bigger, I think, is the only way to characterize what we do. So I thought I'd just give you some perspectives as I see the world evolving. Some of it hasn't happened yet, but some of it are definitely trends that we see. We see, because of the regulatory mandates, um, as they come in, we see a huge increase in the volumes of stuff that we're clearing in the clearinghouse. Um, the new capital liquidity rules, particularly the supplemental leverage ratio, has made everybody look for a clearing solution to try and take advantage of the capital efficiency that goes with it, and in particular, the um, the repo charges, because what's happening is the, um, the sell sides are reducing, and we've noticed this throughout the industry, are reducing their capacity for repo. So the buy side is actually being squeezed a bit in trying to find that capacity. So we found a lot of interest in the buy side coming to us asking to access the clearinghouse directly. Now there's a whole host of issues that go along with that, but that's a trend we see in the industry. So this is the search for improved capital and netting that everybody is looking for. Um, the end users that we're talking about mostly are, for example, pension funds, investment funds, hedge funds, insurance companies. These are the kind of people who are looking to get access. Each of them presents a unique set of problems, um, not least um, the clearinghouse grew up as a as a vehicle, if you like, for banks to trade with each other, to uh, protect against the counterparty risk, and letting one of these unknown or relatively uh, unknown credit classes into the clearinghouse is a big issue. 
because many of them, uh, by their own um, legal constructs, are not allowed to post into the default fund or guarantee fund. So how do you mutualize risk with somebody who's not going to actually allow, who isn't allowed to mutualize risk with you? These are the challenges that we face. Um, the other thing is that more products will definitely move into clearing. We're seeing it all over the place. Um, next year there will be, I think some people say, the end of next year, there will be a increased regulatory charges for uncleared derivatives. And the industry has not found a solution for that yet, despite many false starts. And the cost of um, the standardized treatment of an unclear derivative is pretty prohibitive. So everybody is looking for things like swaptions, um, uh, uh, cross-currency swaps, foreign exchange options, you name it, that's what's coming into clearing. So this is a big expansion in what we do, and those numbers I quoted at the beginning uh, will even get much bigger than, than we've talked about. So the next thing is, in all of this, liquidity is really, really key. Because the solution of a, uh, the clearinghouse is a solution to the kind of Lehman-like event happening again. Uh, the regulators didn't really foresee far enough into what that solution looks like. What is in fact happening now is that if you look at our swaps portfolio, we have all the major swaps in the world, all the banks' swaps books in the world in one place. So that's Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, et cetera, in one place. So the risk from that can be quite large. But the problem that goes with that is if one of those guys had to default, it's all of their swaps that has defaulted, that we have to find positions for the, to close out an auction off those positions. So that creates two liquidity challenges for us. The first is who will buy the auction, the flattened portfolio when we've hedged it. And the second thing is, can we turn the collateral into cash very readily? So that creates a huge need for a CCP. It's like a black hole of liquidity to vacuum up any potential liquidity we can find. So we become, uh, we look for liquidity everywhere we can, so for members first. So will members give us continued liquidity lines, committed liquidity lines? Um, can we find it in the repo market, which is what I was saying at the beginning, that we're very, very heavy users of repo? And finally, what about central banks? Central banks are in one uh, clearinghouse in Paris, we do have access, an operational access to a central bank to provide liquidity. So this is the, if you like, the unforeseen constraint against um, clearing houses growing too big is that liquidity becomes an issue and has to be financed from somewhere. So one of the problems is that as we, um, as we try and liquidate the collateral, the Emir text provides us, uh, is a limitation on what we do. Because it says that no more than 5% of your portfolio, your margins, can be invested unsecured. So we can't just leave our, um, leave our money with a commercial bank and that's the end of it. We, can't, we have to diversify it <clears throat> and we have to make sure that at least 95% is somewhere in the repo market or in a, se a secured facility. That's under CFTC rules is demandable the next day for clients. So not only is it pushing us into the repo market, it's also pushing us to a place where shall we say the appetite overnight funds is not necessarily great in the market as we stand. The regulations also close off an avenue which is available in the US but not available here, which is that we could use money market funds to park the money. Can't do that here, so we actually are forced to be into the repo market. Um, the other um, eventuality that happened a few months ago is that investors, traders, are beginning to price the liquidity difference between the CCPs. So obviously, if you have 90% of the world swaps market, that's very, very deep liquidity, where if you're a trader and you're worried about pricing the exit cost, if you like, of those positions, you would have um, less of a cost in a pool like that than you might in another pool of swaps where there's very little liquidity. So that's turned into a real basis difference 
that actually has a very real P&L effect on the uh, traders in that market. So this is something we've seen emerge. It used to be nobody cared about it, but it's a new risk that's being priced, and it can be quite expensive. So we're talking of the order of tens of millions in remarking swaps books. So it's very real. Um, I think this is a kind of a common theme across the industry, but costs are increasing. Clearing costs are definitely getting bigger. Um, we're moving beyond plain vanilla uh, swaps, plain vanilla bonds, into more uh, exotic things like uh, cross-currency swaps, which involve physical settlement that we don't traditionally, well, we haven't traditionally done outside repos. So, for example, in a cross-currency swap, you're effectively talking about accessing um, the CLS in some way in order to be able to make payments in different currencies to carry on the VM payments that are, are, are called for. So that's a real challenge to us, and it's also not cheap because the liquidity requirements to provide that kind of, in that kind of size can be astronomical, very, very large. So that's one of the big, I would say, trends in the industry is to move into less vanilla-like products, for example, um, swaptions, where it's much more difficult to manage the risk, and it's certainly very, very difficult to manage it at the level and the scale that we're talking about inside a clearinghouse. Um, definitely this complexity is um, coming in part from the ongoing regulations. Huge incentive to clear, as we said, because of the um, large charges that accompany not clearing. But also, um, every day we open the paper, we see another bout of regulations hitting us. Um, for example, MIFID is coming in. Um, we have uh, things like the end of the waterfall discussions with the regulators. These only point in one direction, which is increased capital eventually for members. And of course, the banks are pretty um, beaten up here on all these regulations come in, so eventually there will be a trend to pass these increased capital charges onto the buy side. It's something we, we can't really, we just see it happening that um, people have come to us and say, well, how can we compete in this um, against these uh, hurdles that we face. And of course, at the end of the day, they just pass it back to, to the clients that they service. And also, um, there's a lot of people out there in the industry calling for CCPs to put up more skin in the game. And this is a very, very controversial subject. But effectively, I always ask the question is, tell me what you're worried about in terms of are we missing scenarios? Are we missing um, w risks that we haven't seen before? Because if we are, we will add it to the default fund calculation. And of course, you as members will have to pay that. So what is it that you're worried about? So it turns out that um, different constituents have different um, incentives here, but they just want the CCP to put more money into the game. But the CCP isn't there to subsidize the risks that the members take. The CCP is there to um, manage the, the, um, the pooling of those risks, which is a different thing than take the actual uh, participation of the loss. So for example, it's there to manage losses or potential losses that could arise because of managing these risks, for example, operational risk. The other thing is, too, that on this topic is that many, many regulators have opined on this. And they do not want, they want a private sector solution and to the problem of another Lehman, so to speak, the systemic risk. CCPs are seen to be that. So they want, they don't want CCPs as part of the public sector. Now there are very few CCPs around that actually matter. If you, if you say they can't be in the public sector, then they must be able to, in order to have a private sector solution, they must be able to return the cost of capital to their shareholders. So if you put in that constraint, you will find out that you bound very effectively the skin of the game that a CCP can put into the, the whole solution. And um, so for example, if, if you double the size of the CCP skin in the game, then you will effectively have the return on capital to the shareholders. 
And since the CCP is pretty much a utility or very close to a utility in the terms of it's, it doesn't make 100% returns or anything like that, you, you very quickly get to the point where it's not very, very hard to break through the cost of capital to return that. And then you'll have people exiting that market, so it, it will eventually end up back in the government um, in the government pocket again to run a CCP. So that's not what they want. So that's an in interesting take on the, um, the debate about whether a CCP should have more skin in the game or not. In EMIR, you're required to have 25% skin in the game, whereas in the US doesn't have any requirements. So it's more of a US thing at the moment. Um, because of the cost increase, there's greater, greater focus on um, getting the most from your margins as you possibly can. So cross-margining is one of the buzzwords of the moment. So how do you cross-margin, I don't know, um, interest rate futures against swaps, for example? How can you, um, the same bank, achieve uh, margin reductions for having positions in both asset classes? These are the kind of um, debates that we're having right now. Uh, of course, there are very strong regulatory constraints on doing that. There are, Ymir has, is full of, um, shall we say, qualitative standards, but difficult to actually nail down what the standard exactly says, that, which allows you to cross margin one asset class with another. But that is a very real thing that's under debate. So for example, if you have an equities portfolio, could you offset it against a swaps portfolio? That's one I don't support because the, the correlation, there's, there's no structural link in the same way. There might be some theoretical link, but they don't behave in the same way than in a foreseeable way. Whereas interest rate futures um, have the same, effectively the same risk factors as swaps. And you could actually have a case to do the offsets there should you see them. So anyway, these are longer and longer conversations that are happening, but they're in response to the pressures being felt by the members who are trying to navigate the increased capital charges that we're finding everywhere. Um, you also, the models are beginning to move away from span-based models, the old span, um, which is more of a, a kind of a last century view of the world in terms of how you calculate the margins and more to VAR-based. We have, in our London clearinghouse, we've moved eight services, some, I think it's eight, onto VAR. So swaps, repos, foreign exchange, all these have moved to VAR. So they're more risk sensitive, although you have to be careful that you're making sure that you get all the risks into the model. But um, it's a new dawn, I think, in terms of margin efficiency, because you can't really do margins efficiency across different asset classes unless you have pretty much the same model to throw them in to actually calculate what the reduction would be like. The other big thing we've actually done at LCH is um, compression. So to give you some idea of the numbers, we have reduced the swaps portfolio from $450 trillion of notional down to about, it's approaching $200 trillion right now. That's the power of compression if you can get it running. So that's been a huge boon to the, um, to the industry. And obviously that's one of the reasons we're seeing most of the, um, the growth in that service is because we've been able to innovate like that. But the capital charges, if we don't do that, because they're driven by notional, can be quite punitive. Um, I think one thing that's coming and emerging in this is that collateral is really key. So we have um, collateral transformation where the buy side gives collateral to the bank and the bank gives it to the clearinghouse. But the clearinghouse has to be very, very picky about which kind of collateral it takes. So obviously it has to be stable in value, relatively stable, but more to the point, we have to be able to liquidate that collateral in a matter of hours should there be a systemic event. And when you scan the world and see, you know, what are the available collateral that, that, that you can actually carry that out with, you're not left with very much. So there's a transformation challenge then for the industry to get to the CCP 
the collateral that it can actually use uh, to be safe. Now that's an opportunity obviously for banks because they can perform that service of transformation for a price. But as I say, um, that becomes a really much more important thing now in the day where the capacity of the bank's balance sheet is somewhat constrained and getting even more constrained every day. Um, the other thing is that the banks themselves, as we know, have had collateral management teams for quite some time, and some of them are very sophisticated. The CCPs have been much slower to catch up, but we're, we're, we have those capabilities now. It took us a while to get them, but this isn't the CCP of the last century that we're talking about. We actually know the value. We know when we're, we're being taken advantage of by banks in terms of uh, their collateral transformation groups doing certain things in terms of cheapest to deliver, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're doing now is we have put in rules which effectively stop that or mitigate um, the excesses that we used to see in the past, which have made the clearinghouse much safer. So for example, we used to have a bank, a very large bank, who gave us no cash as a CCP, but whose um, margin was all in the form of 60-year gilts. Now, good luck transforming that into several billion of cash when you need it. So what we have now is a, is a member-specific uh, limit on the level of cash that you can post. You can't get away with that kind of behavior anymore. But that's just an example of how we're, taking, how we're looking at and examining these problems and trying to make the CCP safer. Um, the other thing that's happening is the, the relative value of cash versus collateral, uh, paper versus bonds that we take uh, is changing around every day. And especially in this kind of environment, um, it flips all over the place. A yield, low yield environment, lots of volatility happening in various places in the world. Um, we have to be really on our toes to make sure that we're not being taken advantage of. Because at the end of the day, we're supposed to be there for a systemic reason. So taking advantage of a CCP, while it may make sense to the actual incumbent or to the member, is not a real long-term um, thing you would hope for, because you want the CCP to be as strong as possible. That's one of the challenges that we face. Then, um, to talk about the future, <laughs> it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, there are. Uh, certainly, the only thing we can be sure of is that more regulation is coming. So, for example, we have enhanced procyclicality standards, which we've been given by the Bank of England, and which are on its way, as far as we can see, in the uh, continental Europe, yet to really appear in formal form in the US, but certainly that is a constraint. So obviously people know what procyclicality means. It means that you should not experience a margin jump that's too big in response to margins, uh, in response to a uh, market move. The problem we face, though, as a CCP is that if the market has moved and we don't raise margins, then we are not fulfilling our obligation to make sure there's enough protection there. So there's a real conundrum in how you resolve that. But that's one of the, as I said, costs are increasing because regulation is reshaping the industry. What it effectively means is that we can't let margins drop too much because if it drops too much in quiet times, then should a systemic event happen, they would rise again by way too much. So we kind of have to keep back margin rather than give it back. We can't give it back to members as you would think. We have to slow down the acceleration uh, of margin give back in, during quiet times. But that just shows you some of the challenges that we face. Another one is all of these considerations around the end of the waterfall. Who pays? What is the difference between recovery and resolution? These are open-ended open questions that still have not been resolved. When does the CCP finish recovery and formally go into resolution? How is that managed? And what, what is the role of regulators in that whole conversation? Who makes that decision? These are all wide open. Obviously, um, there's been a lot of publicity on this one recently, but we're still way away from a solution. But you can bet that whatever the solution is, it's going to be costly to implement. Another one that's um, received lots of attention and we support is standardized stress testing. It's very, very difficult for members to compare two CCPs 
if it's apples and oranges, completely different standards for membership application, completely different margin models, different holding periods, different confidence levels, different default management standards, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, I think we've written a paper and published it in terms of how you would actually do this, what would it make sense, and at least you have a minimum set of standards that's comparable across CCPs and would allow members to access or to assess the real risk from one CCP to another. So effectively what you have to do is, is in each of the scenarios that might happen, you have to understand what the impact on the default fund would be, how much default fund would be used, and under what circumstances would you go for assessment rights? Because the CCP has the right to assess uh, three times, at least in our case, the unfunded margin. So we can come back to the well several times. So the question is, you know, under what circumstances would you do that? What would have to happen in the market in order to, to stimulate those events, to ignite those events? And obviously then there's more and more disclosure coming. We have the PFMI um, standards, the Basel IOSCO standards, lots and lots of numbers. Not clear what they're going to disclose other than lots and lots of numbers. There's, we're missing a digestion of, of what the information is. But at any rate, we have to do all this. Um, it's a lot of positions uh, that come through us. We have to um, build the infrastructure that would um, disclose this. The other aspect I'd like to talk about is the how many CCPs should we have? A lot, a few, et cetera, et cetera. What's actually happening on the ground is that um, CCPs seem to be coalescing around an asset class in each region. And banks in each, in each region don't want to bifurcate their portfolio in two different asset class, in, in the same asset class with two different CCPs. So what seems to be happening is a, a, um, a race towards one CCP with critical mass in each given region for an asset class. Now, it's not necessarily the same CP, CCP for all asset classes. It can be varied by asset class. Um, the other thing I mentioned is that the universe of cleared products will definitely, definitely increase because the standardized capital charges are way too draconian for most of these to actually survive outside of clearing. And then, of course, as I said, everybody wants a part of this, so you'll see more and more direct end users rather than coming through banks as sponsors, if you like, but they will actually try and access the CCP directly. So I think um, they were the remarks that I wanted to, to make, so I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Glockin. Very, again, very salient points. Any questions for Dennis? Yes, right at the front. Can we have a mic, please? Thank you very much. And you mentioned that uh, and you do a lot of ripple because you have a lot of margin calls from different uh, clearing members. And I'm wondering if you need to uh, use Ripple to kind of find returns for your cash, and with who is your counterparty for your Ripple business? And if giving the cash amount is very big, are you looking for Ripple to the big banks, which are also your clearing members? Is there kind of contradict to you know what you collect the margin for? Yeah, we have um, we had to do this. Um, we have to have a cross. Um, risk view across the asset classes. So for example, for every member that we have, we know their clearing risk. But if we also have treasury risk with that member, we also record that. If they're a settlement platform, some of them do have settlement platforms, we also record that. And we put that all together so we see the entire picture and we're not allowed to have too much exposure to each of these members in these asset classes across these, these um, services. So we do make sure that we smooth out the uh, the risks so that they don't, we don't have all the risk in one person. So for example, you might have a very big clearing relationship in one asset class, um, but you might have also historically um, invested that asset class on a bilateral repo with that member outside the clearing service. That's not allowed because there's too much concentration there. 
Um, may I just, just explore that a bit further? But just at the aggregate level then, I mean, I, uh, spot on question, I was thinking the same. I, I was just thinking at the aggregate level, you've got the, the large, you're clearing for the large banks, they're placing collateral with you, cash and paper. At the same time, you, I think if I understood correctly, you're not allowed to place cash um, with a credit risk institution. So, it's, and so yeah. for example, if it's not, let's say, for example, the central bank, it's going yeah. to be someone that you need collateral in return for. I, I'm just wondering, at the aggregate level, there's a lot of netting out to zero there, isn't there? No, but no, no, not at all. Uh, we don't allow, um, if you're big in clearing, if we have a big relationship with you in clearing, you can't have a big relationship with us on the treasury side. And you can't have a big relationship with us on the settlement side. So, we're all, so what we'd have, there's many more participants, though, to, than our members. So the members are the big banks, but there's also the investment funds, all of these course. kind of vehicle pension funds, et cetera, who will repo with us. Got it. Okay. Who are different. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I think we had one here. On to clearing houses. And I think the other important point you mentioned was about um, and we've got a mathematician here, so he would understand the point at infinity. The natural conclusion is uh, not lots of CCPs, but really a super global single CCP. It inexorably, these arguments lead to that. Now, whether politically or from regulatory point of view that can happen or not is, you know, that's reality. But really, I can see why, why that would make sense, but with its own risks as well. Uh, my question is more about more complex products. Now, if you look at something in terms of volumes or you know, outstanding notionals. You mentioned 450 trillion for interest rate swaps and compactifying down, down to 200 trillion. But if you, if you turn it around, let's say, I'll take an example, the dollar yen market. So let's go back pre-Lehman. Uh, now as a practitioner playing the wall market, I can tell you that PRDCs, maybe much smaller in volume, it was the tail that wagged the dog. So if you did not understand PRDCs, you were not going to understand the first and second generation FX exotics markets. You could not understand the vanilla market. You could not understand the forward and the spot market. So while um, it's quite interesting to analyze in terms of volumes um, or outstanding notionals, I would not at all underestimate that products with smaller volumes, how much of an impact they have on global risk and liquidity and obviously default as well. So, so it's quite interesting what sort of um, in-house effort is being made by, let's say, LCH to bring those on, on board from a technological point of view. So they're not on board yet. I have um, obviously deep risk reservations about some of these products coming on board. But on the other hand, we're facing probably a 17 to 20 fold increase in the capital requirements in an uncleared space to support these products. So when you put one against the other, you say, well, the only way out, there's gonna be a huge effort to try and drive them into a CCP. But obviously, um, you, might, you might say that um, it's the death of some of the more exotic classes because this capital charges completely um, rule them out. Or there might be a private sector solution. So for example, there is um, an effort, much publicized, to create a margin calculator, which somehow would because the regulations would allow in this new uncleared uh, rules that if you could get uh, regulatory approval to use a calculator that was signed up by all the counterparties and the regulators, then you could margin with respect to that as long as you do um, two-way posting of collateral daily. So there's a huge drive to try and produce that, but to date nobody's been successful. So all I'm, I'm saying here is this natural force at work inside the market to drive us to if you can't do that, can you do central clearing? And that's what we see. We haven't said yes, because we don't quite completely grasp how you would do it yet. Uh, because obviously the more complex, the more hard it is to get a critical mass and to actually find, uh, to auction that portfolio should the necessity need arise. So for example, in swaptions, one of the problems I had was there are not that many players in the world who are market makers at the, at the kind of scale we're talking about in swaptions. So if I can't default manage a product, well, why should we be clearing that product? These are the, the, the problems we face. So you might say, okay, well then why don't you just do more vanilla to the more vanilla scale? Well, we could do that. Um, 
it, it satisfies some of that, but it doesn't meet, meet the market need to, there'll always be variations that they want to do, but there's some point at which we can't go beyond. More direct access to uh, clearing for end users. Uh, how do you see this uh, playing out, and how far do you think it will go? In terms of the extreme, of course, being the direct clearing membership. Well, I mean, as a CRO, I have deep reservations about that because if you um, if you just open up the world, they won't meet our credit standards. There are many, many investment managers out there, or funds, or who are who are not um, in our parlance, who are not. Um, who are subprime, call them what you want, but they don't effectively make the prime grade. And our current regulations, our current rules is that we can't offer membership to anybody who doesn't at least make it into the prime space. So that straight away rules out many, many smaller funds. And there's an operational risk requirement as well in terms of how they could effectively run the margins. They have to be able to absorb for default management purposes a portfolio of I think 100,000 positions, things like that. So a lot of the small players go out automatically. Um, but on the other hand, you have these giant pension companies, really highly rated, Dutch insurance companies, for example, who are facing, you know, right now they're on an exemption, but um, it's a short-lived one. They will have to eventually start to clear. And uh, so just to give you an example, the problems that we have there is that they are obviously rich in collateral, but it's bonds, corporate bonds. How are we going to take over bonds and turn it into cash in a matter of a few hours? So we have, there are not many, many places we can go. So they're the challenges we have, but ultimately the bigger, bigger uh, companies will figure out how, how they can get, you know, get into the clearinghouse because for some it's not a credit issue, it's not an operational issue, it's a question of a collateral transformation issue. So there are different discussion for each sector is what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you very much. In the interest of time, we'll have to stop it there. Thank you for that, uh, your contributions on the floor. And Mr. McLaughlin, appreciate that very much.